Lord, I pray over this message and I pray that we all are here to listen from you. Amen. Xander cutting up again. That's, that's your grandchild, Gina. All right. Um, kiddos, head on. Sorry, I, I, got, I got distracted there with Xander. He's cracking me. I want to leave him in here. All right, Shannon? We got him? All right. Uh, and let me say this real quick, just as an advertisement. If you are not and have not uh, ever served in our children's area during their 242 groups, uh, we need you to help out. Because um, I told Deanne the other day, I said, well, if you need me to teach, um, I'll just go out with them and just leave the pulpit empty. And somebody can take my place here because we need people serving there. So if you don't want that to happen, if you don't want me to just excuse myself and go down there and teach children's church while y'all sit here and stare at each other, you need to volunteer. Go see Deanne. You need to take part. You need to take your stand and man your post. And down there in children's ministry, we need that. So don't, don't make me have to walk down there, all right? Nobody wants that, especially those kids. All right. Um, hey, it, it, I want us to start off by going to Proverbs. Go to Proverbs 1. Uh, I want to set the stage because I was thinking about this last night, and I thought, man, how cool is this that Proverbs really meant a lot to the people we're studying? And you got to set the, 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 the chronology with, with Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs were written, most of them were written by Solomon, Solomon reigned um, from, we think, about 970 until 930 uh, B.C. It's, it's actually kind of interesting. There is no historical record outside of the Bible of King Solomon. We don't have any historical record whatsoever outside of that, even though he was this amazing king that did amazing things, was so wealthy and, you know, fleets of ship. Uh, I mean, it just, he didn't plant gardens. He planted forests. All right, so he didn't build ships, he built fleets. I mean, just an amazing person. So he writes probably the, the late, uh, what I say, 970 to 930. Our king today is going to reign just uh, inside of the, the 700s. So it's about 150 years later. But I want to start with, with, in Proverbs, you can see that first verse, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. It says, for learning what wisdom and discipline are, for understanding insightful sayings, for receiving wise instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity, for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man. A wise man will listen and increase his learning, and a discerning man will obtain guidance. For understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline, and look at verse eight carefully. Listen, my son, to your father's instructions. Now, if we wanna go specifically into that, who was, who was the son of Solomon? Who is this first king that we studied? What was his name, do y'all remember? Starts with a Rehoboam. There you go, good, Rehoboam, good. I knew y'all would get it, just a little hint there. So he's writing to Rehoboam, and okay? And, and, and I think it's very easy for us to say, he wasn't just writing to Rehoboam. He was writing to succeeding generations. Here's wisdom. Here's wisdom. You need to learn it. All right? So we get Rehoboam. How does he do? How does he do? I want you to turn over a very familiar passage to 3, verses 5 and 6. And I think this is kind of a linchpin of the beginning of Proverbs. It's sort of an over, overarching thing. And you probably memorized it growing up. So when you read it in the Holman or other translations, you're gonna go in, no, that's not the way it's supposed to read. Because you memorized it in what? Just like all of us, we all memorized it in the King James, all right? So verse five says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. Think about him in all your ways. That's not right, is it? No, it's not right. It's not think about him, it's what? In all your ways, acknowledge him. There we go, old school, all right? and he will guide you on the right paths, and he will make your way straight, all right? Now, here's the problem, here's what we do, and here's what we do wrong with this, and here's what I think all these kings that come after uh, Rehoboam do wrong. They focus on the imperative, okay? 
Now, if you haven't done English in a while and you're going, what's an imperative? Imperative is when someone tells you to do something. That's an imperative statement. Go do this. And what are those imperatives? Trust, do not rely, think or acknowledge, all right? And he will guide your steps. Here's the problem. Trusting is easy. We trust all sorts of stuff. You walked in here today, and without even thinking about it, you just plop right down in that chair, and you trusted that it would hold you up, right? You got in your car this morning. Some of you prayed it would start. Some of you trusted it would start. I've been there on both sides, all right? But you trusted it would get you there. You trusted the people in the other lane would not come over and just swerve in there and kill you, all right? You trust in a lot of things this morning. Trust is easy. We do it all the time. Here's what's hard. Trusting in the Lord. So I want you to take your eyes off of the imperatives of three, five, and six today and keep your eyes on the object of the imperative. You can look in here, look look at your Bible. In five, it says this, trust in the Lord. Now, what's odd about the spelling of the word Lord there? Hopefully, most of you have all caps. Now, when it uses all caps, it's the word, it's the word Yahweh, or it's the word Jehovah which literally means the name of God, so it would be Yahweh the Elohim, all right? Yahweh the God, all right? The Lord God Almighty is Yahweh Elohim El Shaddai, all right? So I'm not, that's about the extent of my Hebrew knowledge, all right? I'm not good at the Hebrew stuff, all right? But this is the idea. Now, when it, anytime, now there are times in the Bible that Lord is not all caps, all right? It's just L-O-R-D. That is the word Adonai, which is our word kurios in the Greek, which just means Lord, master, the one who's in charge. But anytime you see Lord, caps, it's talking about Yahweh, the name of God. So when it says this, it says, trust in Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Trust in him. Get your eyes off of the imperative and get your eyes on the object. In all your ways, acknowledge Yahweh the God of Moses who gave the Ten Commandments. And he, the God of David, the God who made David king over all of Israel, he will make your path straight. Here's the problem, though. We get our eyes on trusting and acknowledging, and we want to gut this thing out, and we want to willpower this thing out, and we get so focused on our own efforts that we lose sight of the object that we should be directing our efforts to. Everybody with me? Amen? All right, because let's think about, how did these guys do? How did Rehoboam do? As soon as he established himself, what did he do? Abandon the Lord. His son, Abijah, does a great job in the battle. Hey, you Israelites are bad people. He's got all the right saying. He says the right thing. He's been in church plenty. He probably grew up in Texas, watches Fox News, votes Republicans, the whole nine yards, but his life was a train wreck because all it was was a head knowledge. His son Asa comes along, starts off awesome, and then older in life, a little bitty army comes against him, what's he do? He goes and bribes the Arameans, and God says to him, the eyes of the Lord look throughout the earth, looking to be strong for him whose heart is devoted to him. You failed, Asa. Jehoshaphat comes along, awesome guy, dumb as a brick, Besides, hey, it'd be a great idea to go hang out with King Ahab, right? Hey, even better, our kids seem to like each other. Why don't we marry them off? What could go wrong? Everything, all right? Jehoram comes along, marries Athaliah. They've got a horrible train wreck of a kid. The whole kingdom is getting killed off one generation after another. Athaliah even takes the reins of the kingdom and starts killing everybody off until what? Till Joash is taken, and he's taken by Jehoiada the priest. Now, how are we doing with this trust in the Lord? Trust in Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of Moses, the God of David. How are our kings doing? How are the sons of Solomon in, in the generations right after the Proverbs have been written? How are they doing trusting in Yahweh? God, what's happened? Their eyes have been completely lost. They have sort of this religious thing that they do, but it has no heart. 
It has no contact. It has no emotion to it. And a lot of you sitting in this room right now are exactly the same way. You play a good game on Sunday. You walk into this building. You put on your happy little face. But Monday through Saturday, you know the name of Yahweh never crosses your lips. You know trusting in him is the last thing on your mind. You trust in that bank account that you've been working on all your life. You trust in those relationships. You trust in this job that you have. And it's infinitely more important than the Lord your God. Joash comes along and he does well as long as what? As long as Jehoiada's spoon feeding him. And as soon as Jehoiada dies, what happens? Train wreck. And now his son takes over. Go with me over here to, to 2 Chronicles 25. I like Amaziah because the story in Kings matches almost, almost identically to the story in Chronicles, so we don't have to compare and contrast. We can just camp out in Chronicles. So 2 Chronicles 25 is where we're gonna be today. So let's start reading this thing. You with me, Xander? I see you. You're gonna cheer for me today. All right, you're gonna cheer when I say amen, I bet. All right, here we go, 25-1. Amaziah became king when he was 25 years old. Young man, young, young man, right? Getting younger every day. 25 years old, he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoiadan. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the Lord's sight, but not wholeheartedly. Does anybody have a different word than wholeheartedly? Is that, is that pretty much, I think that's pretty much across the board. It means in, 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 the, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it, it means that his heart was not full. It's the word pleroo, which means to fill up. When the, when the widow gives her offering, she says she gives her two mites, but everybody else was giving out of their overflow. All right, the stuff that's spilling out of the cup, that's what they were giving out of. This was it. It, it wasn't full to overflowing. His heart was not full to overflowing. Now, some of you, like myself, have teenagers, and you may have seen this at some point. They did what was right, but not wholeheartedly. Go take out the garbage. Oh, I would love to, Father. May I, may I please have the honor of taking out the garbage because I desire wholeheartedly to seek your will, oh, great Father of mine. <laughs> I don't get that. I get, I did it last time. It's his turn, which is horrible with twins because you're going, I can't remember which one did it last time because they just look alike and it's hard. And so, yes, this, this is very clear. We should understand this. And I think if you look in a mirror, you probably see somebody else who has these same qualities. They did what was right, but not wholeheartedly. Your heart was not full. You did not do things out of the overflow of your heart. You had to reach way down deep inside to find some devotion to God. And that's not how we wanna live. That's not trusting in the Lord, Yahweh. That's not acknowledge Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It should be this amazing overflow, all right? So keep that in mind. That's, that's kind of his, his mantra. Because you see, next week we're gonna look at Uzziah and we're gonna look at Jotham. And what it's gonna say is they did what was right just like their father did. Well, their father did what was right, but not wholeheartedly. So that means Uzziah did what? What was right, but not wholeheartedly. And then Jotham is gonna do what his father did. And then we're gonna hit Ahaz, and you see how this ends up after a couple of generations, and it's not pretty at all. Verse three, as soon as the kingdom was firmly in his grasp, he executed his servants who had murdered his father, the king. Now, you can go back and read 24 if you need to catch up on that. However, he did not put their children to death because as it is written in the law, in the Torah, in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded fathers must not die because of their children and children must not die because of their fathers but each one will die for his own sin. Now, does anybody get a glimmer of hope for Amaziah at this point? He, he exacts vengeance on the, on the men that killed his father. That, that's okay, right? All right? And he has this, the sense of mind and the sense of ethic and morals, according to the Torah, that he doesn't go and kill their kids. Because what does everybody else do at this time and period in history? When one person dies, Everybody's gotta die, right? 
again, go back a couple of generations with Jehoram, with Ahaziah, with, uh, with Joash. Everybody's dying, okay? But that's not how he does. And so it's kind of like, wow, maybe he paid attention. Was this his father's influence? Remember, his father did well right until after Jehoiada died. And I sometimes wonder, you know, did, did, as, as Amaziah was growing up, I mean, he's 25 years old when he becomes king, all right? He's fully aware of what's going on. Remember, it was just that last year of Joash's life where he kind of just tanks. I wonder if he went along with his father chasing after the idols. I wonder if he ever spoke up. I wonder if he ever said anything. When his father was killing Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, who had raised him, when he was killing him, I wonder if Amaziah went, Dad, wait, whoa, whoa, wait, hey, hey, whoa. We can't do that. We shouldn't do that. That's a, I just wonder what his personality was. I wonder if he was looking at all these things. So he executes the murders. Keep going, let's go. Verse five. Then Amaziah gathered Judah and assembled them according to their ancestral house, according to commanders of thousands, according to commanders of hundreds. He numbered those 20 years old or more for all of Judah and Benjamin, all right? 20 years old, that's a magic number. If you go back to numbers, you'll see they numbered the men according to fighting age, which would have been 20 or older, okay? So he's gonna number all them from Judah and Benjamin. Look at the next verse. He found there to be 300,000 choice men who could serve in the army, bearing spears and shield. Now, let's stop right there. (laughs) How did he find that number? Do you just kind of walk up and go, hmm, I just found 300,000? No, how do you find a specific number like 300,000? What do you do? This is not a hard question, all right? You count them, right? Now, why do you count the number of troops that you have? He gathers his troops, puts them all into categories, and he finds that he's got 300,000. Why? Because he's counting. Now, is counting a bad thing? Why do you want to count? Why do you want to know how many troops you have? So that you what? So that you can know how well you can do. Now, some people would say that's wise, that's whatever. In the Old Testament, counting can sometimes be a very bad thing. Because what is it conveying? Because if I sit there and count how many troops, what happens to my confidence? If I have a low number, what happens to my confidence? If I have a very large number, what happens to my confidence? Now, where is God, the one in whom we are trusting with all of our, where is God in this equation? Some of you do this with your own life. You go to your bank account and you go, I am very depressed. (laughs) And some of you think, I can do anything. Where is God in that equation? You see, our confidence should not be on these things, these obvious external factors that we can count and that we can measure. Because when we do that, what happens to trust in the Lord with all your heart? Remember, trusting's easy. I can trust if I have a good bank account. I can trust if I have a good job. I can trust if I have all these external things, but when these things start to tank, what happens to my trust? It follows the things that are external, not the constant that is Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Everybody with me? So why count? Why does he want to know? You see, what, what I argue that because the next word says this in verse six. Then, after counting, what does he do? Then, for 7,500 pounds of silver, he hired 100,000 brave warriors from Israel. Why? Why do you count, understand how many you have? I have 300,000 fighting men, and I go, I've got $7,500 laying, or 7,500 pounds of silver. And and you need to understand this. That's not a small amount of money. 7,500 pounds of silver could have bought him 500 chariots, okay? Okay? Now, Solomon would said to have had 1,500 
chariots in total in his massive army that he had. With all of his wealth, he only had, I think it's 1,400 chariots. Amaziah could have bought 500 chariots for what he does. But my question is, why, after counting and saying, I have 300,000, why does he go hire mercenaries from Israel? What is he thinking? How is he trusting? In whom is he trusting? Do you see? Do you see where we're going with this? What's his heart? Is he sitting there going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like my father, my great, 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 great grandfather Solomon, and I'm gonna trust in Yahweh, the God of Moses, the God of David. I'm gonna trust that one, the one who, in whom David trusted when he stood against Goliath, the, the one who my great, great, great grandfather Jehoshaphat said, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, Yahweh. And he sat there in the midst of that. Amaziah counts 300,000 troops and he says what? I don't have enough men. So I will take my wealth. What's he trusting in here? I will take my wealth and I will go hire 100,000 more because I don't trust that I have enough with the 300,000. Now, how does God handle this situation with Gideon? Gideon shows up, and he says, we gotta muster an army, and he gets as many people as he can, and God goes, says what? You have too many. And Gideon goes, I don't even know what that means. How can you have too many soldiers when you're gonna fight a battle against somebody who has way more troops than you even have? He goes, you got too many you're gonna trust in them and not trust in me. You're gonna see external factors and you're not going to turn to me and not gonna ask me. And this is the problem. Amaziah counts his 300,000 and he says what? I don't trust that I will be able to win this victory because I don't have enough. So he takes his possessions and goes and hires 100,000 more. And now he thinks what? Now, God will hand me the victory because I've been so wise to go hire more people. That's not how it works in your life either. If you're gonna trust in the Lord, Yahweh, the creator of all things, then you're gonna trust in him. I don't care how much is in your bank account. I don't care how sustainable your job is. I don't care what kind of relationship you're in. You're gonna trust in him no matter what the external situation is. And if the externals change that, then those are the things you had your trust in, not in the Lord. Everybody see that? <clears throat> All right, we gotta get after him because this is just wrong. Because why go to Israel? Why to go to Israel? Israel, they're, they're horrible people. They, they didn't just build one golden calf. They did what? They built two. They, they said, anybody want to be a priest? Ah, it doesn't matter if you're a Levite. Just come on. We'll make you a priest too. Just utterly defying God. What did I say? They had eight coup attempts or eight coups out of like 19 kings. There's eight of them. Just wipe them out coups. These are horrible, horrible people who've absolutely turned away and abandoned God. And yet, Amaziah thought, I want to go bring them onto my side. I wonder if we're like that. God, I, I, don't, I don't trust you just in general, and I don't trust what you provided, so I'm not just gonna go somewhere neutral. I'm gonna go to someone who hates you, despises you, has turned their back utterly against you, and I'm gonna ally myself with them because then I will have some peace and comfort and security do you think God feels in this moment? You know what? How do you think God feels when you, in your sadness and your depression and your loneliness, go, God, you're not enough for me. I want to go find a man or a woman that will satisfy my loneliness. Oh, they hate you. They have nothing to do with you. They don't have any desire to be with you, but I'll feel better 
And God's going, am I not enough? Am I not enough? They went to Israel. Verse seven, however, a man of God came to him and said, King, do not let Israel's army go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel. The Lord is not with that person. The Lord is not in that job that you think is going to bring you security and comfort and peace. God's not in that. You should know better. <clears throat> All the Ephraimites. But if you go, <laughs> if you go with them, do it. Be strong for battle. Knock yourself out, in other words. But God will make you stumble before the enemy. For God has the power to help or to make one stumble. There's the battle right there. There's the battle. Knock yourself out. Go for it. Do the best you can. God's gonna make you stumble. Because God is not going to let you succeed outside of his provision. Because if he does, what's gonna happen? Next time around, are you gonna look to God for this? No, you're gonna go, hey, let me go check the bank account. Let me go check, see if I have this. Let me go check, see if I have this. Because you will eventually develop this habit and pattern of not depending on God, not approaching him. Now, I've, I thought for a while, you know, God, why didn't you send this man of God before he made the decision to hire? Probably because Amaziah didn't ask. God, what should I do? You know, I, I, I counted up my troops. I've got 300,000. I don't think that's enough. God, what do you want me to do? Because you know what? Sometimes we don't pray because we think God may pull a Gideon on us. Everybody with me? God, we go, oh, Lord, I only have $5,000 in the bank account. What shall I do? And God goes, you got too much money. Let's give four grand away and let's see how we can do with this thing. And you're going, oh, Lord, I just don't hear you speaking to me. <laughs> Please speak clearly to me. <laughs> you want me to say it again? I think we just don't want that. And at no point does Amaziah get on his face and say, God, I trust in you. Yahweh, God of my fathers, I trust in you. Tell me what I should do. Speak to me clearly. No, God has to send somebody in here going, what are you thinking? Anybody ever been there before? Has God ever sent anyone to your life and just to go, what are you thinking? And you're going, what? Huh? Uh, uh, uh. The man of God comes and says, don't let Israel go with you. You want to go? You better buck up because God can make you stumble. He is not going to let you succeed outside of his provision. And a good, loving God wouldn't do that. <clears throat> um, nine, then Amaziah said to the man of God, what should I do about the 7,500 pounds of silver I gave to Israel's division What's his concern when the, the prophet, this man of God, comes and says, don't let Israel go with you. If you do, you will stumble because God will make you stumble. What should he have said next? I am so sorry. I have failed. I did not even consider the thing. You are right. But no, what does he ask? Uh, you, you know, I've already made the deposit. It's non-refundable. I can't get my money back. And I think the man of God just looked at him and just was incredulous. You would rather go ahead with your plan knowing that God will make you stumble because you threw a couple of bucks this way? Because you put some time into this relationship? And you think, well, you know, how bad can it be? He's a really nice guy. I've put so much time already, and I really don't have any other prospects. I'm just going to go ahead. How bad can it be? Amaziah, what, what, about, my, what about the money? I love this next line. Listen to this. Some of y'all need to write this down, tattoo it somewhere on yourself. I don't know what you need to do, but you need to hear this. The man of God replied to his question about what should I do about the money? 
the Lord is able to give you much more than this. Whatever you think you can achieve on your own, in your own effort, in your own strivings, in your own wisdom and knowledge and shrewdness and all this stuff, he said, are you kidding me? You think God can't make up this 7,500 pounds of silver? That's nothing. You, you think your investment is so, you just gotta go ahead with it. God can give you much more than him. You hear me, single ladies? God can give you much more than him. Guys, single guys, God can give you much more than her. You do not have to just settle and go along because that's where you've been. Because all you're doing is saying, God, I don't trust you. I just don't trust you, God. And I can't go up because this is available and this is, seems easy and seems, God can give you much more than this. I'll never forget, I'm at a fraternity party my um, senior year in college. I was dating a girl, but we were kind of hitting the rocks. It just wasn't going well. And I was kind of moaning about this just to a good friend of mine, Nancy Tedder. And I said, Nancy, I just, I don't know what to do. And she goes, Bob, don't you know that if, if this is not the right person for you, that God has someone infinitely better to give you someday? Hey, <laughs> you're not that much better than me. So <laughs> yeah, I did outkick my coverage, but come on now. Give me a little bit, Derek. I hear you. But no, she said that to me, and I've never forgotten it. That if this isn't the one, imagine how great the right one is going to be. You know why? Because the Lord can give you much more than this piddly little 7,500 pounds of silver that you've invested in this. But you have to do what? Trust in the Lord. Not just trust, not just generic, but trust in God's provision. So, I love this. 10, so Amaziah released the division. He obeyed. We're doing pretty well so far, right? We've hit a couple of bumps, but Amaziah, he doesn't go, no, I'm going anyway. He obeys. He releases this division that came from Ephraim to go home, but they got very angry with Judah and returned home in a fierce rage. They end up sacking a bunch of cities on the border, killing 3,000 men and taking a bunch of plunder. And I'm going, why? <laughs> when someone hires you to be a mercenary and they don't actually go through with it, but they still pay you, I'm thinking that's a win-win. I don't have to die, maybe, and I got paid. I'd be going home going, hmm, sucker, <laughs> I'm good. But they came in a fierce rage because you know why? Because your foolish decisions always have consequences. And the best way to raise a fool is to remove the consequences from his folly. Let me say that again in case you didn't hear it. The best way to raise a fool is to remove the consequences from his folly. Now, Amaziah, let's get to him, verse 11. Amaziah strengthened his position and led his people to the Valley of Salt. Guess where the Valley of Salt is located next to? We're going south, Dead Sea, all right? He struck down 10,000 Seerites. There's a mountain called Mount Seir. Uh, the Edomites, the, that, that whole southern region, it's all the same thing. And the Judites, verse 12, this is interesting. The Judites captured 10,000 alive. They took them to the top of a cliff. Now, anybody been to Israel besides my wife? You get around the Dead Sea, you have these huge cliffs, all right? So they take these 10,000 people they captured alive. They took them to the top of the cliff where they threw them off and all of them were dashed to pieces. You know, if I'm like number 9,000 somewhere in there, I'm fighting somebody, I don't know, I'm gonna die up here and not getting splatted down there. I just, that's just me, all right? As for the men of the division that Amaziah sent back, they would not go, uh, they would not go with him into battle. They raided the cities of Judea from Samaria to Beth Haran, struck down 3,000 of their people and took a great deal of plunder. Now here's the thing, what should happen next? 
You go south to the Valley of Salt. You win this tremendous battle. You capture 10,000 people. You make them jump off the cliffs. They splat on the bottom. Victory. We win. Now, did you need to count? Did you need to count, Amaziah? Did you need to hire more people? No, what did you need to do? You needed to trust me. You don't need to count how many people. You counting is not gonna make your numbers go up, amen? You looking at your bank account is not gonna make that number increase. You stressing over all these things isn't going to change a thing. You trusting in Yahweh acknowledging Yahweh in all your ways will change everything. They did not need to count, surely didn't need to hire. They go and they have this amazing victory with numbers they thought were not enough. And so what should Amaziah do? How should he come back into Jerusalem after this battle? He should come in what? Praising God, because God told him, you don't need those 100,000. I can give you more than this. And guess what? He probably did. When he plundered the people of Mount Seir, he probably got more than that. So what should happen next to the man who trusts in Yahweh? After Amaziah came from the attack on the Edomites, he brought the gods of the Seirites and set them up as his gods. He worshiped before them and burned incense to them. So the Lord's anger was against Amaziah. Is anybody just screaming at Amaziah right now? Is it, you know, if you've ever been to the movie theater and, and, and people yell at the screen, all right? I don't know, we're very Anglo-centric in here right now. You wanna go have fun? go to a movie that's not as Anglo-centric, all right, especially a scary movie, okay? It's just fun, I'm just saying. When I was in college, I went with a bunch of football players one time to a movie, never had so much fun in my life, all right? They are screaming at the screen, just yelling at the screen, no, don't do that, you don't wanna do that, and I'm just going, wow, I've never had this experience before. It was good stuff, it's like going to a black church, all right? They encourage their pastor a lot more than y'all encourage me along the way. But I preached long enough, amen? Oh, I get that. I, now I get some amen. But, but here's the thing. Somebody should be yelling at the screen. No, no. Your grand, great, great grandfather said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you go and you destroy this army. You send 10,000 off the cliff. And what's your first thought? Let's grab their gods. Let's, let's go get the things they trusted in and let's put our trust in those blocks of wood and that stone item. And the Lord's anger burned against him. Good. The Lord's anger should burn against you when you do the exact same thing. When your initial, you should be trusting in the Lord. You should step back and go, God, you did that. I, I will trust you more. I should have trusted you more, but I'm going to trust you more in the future. And the Lord's anger burns, burned against him. So what does God send in his anger and in his wrath? What does God send to Amaziah? A prophet. What? You're not supposed to send prophets. You're supposed to send fire and brimstone, right? A massive army to destroy him. No, but God sent a prophet. Now, why does God send prophets? to bring you back to him. Why in the world would God act this way? In his anger, he does what? He sends a prophet, why? Because his love is so much bigger than his anger. And God understands just how stupid you can be. And he goes, let me give him another chance. And then when that prophet doesn't work, what does he do? I'll send another one. I'll send another one. This prophet comes. Look at, look at the text. Verse, uh, verse 15. Why have you sought a people's gods that could not deliver their own people from your hands? While he was still speaking, the king asked, have you made, uh, have you, excuse me, have we made you the king's counselor? Stop. Why should you lose your life? 
not a good idea to talk to God's prophet like that. You see, what should he have said? What should Amaziah have said? Just the same, when he comes home from the battle after this amazing victory, what should he have done? Trust in the Lord with all his heart and lean not on his own understanding. His understanding was what? I need 100,000 more. God was saying, no, you don't. I will provide enough for you. I will be more than enough for you. But he leaned on his own understanding and God corrected him and God was right. And what should he have come home and said, God, I leaned on my own understanding. That was a mistake. I shouldn't do that anymore. But he brings home these gods. So God, in his anger, sends him prophets. So what should he do in this moment? God, I'm sorry I was wrong. What was I thinking? I absolutely lost my mind. I should be worshiping and trusting in you, acknowledging you with all my heart and leaning not on my own understanding. But I turned to these gods. I am so, so sorry. But he says what? He threatens the prophet. He threatens to kill him. Prophet responds with this. I know that God intends to destroy you because you have done this and not listen to my advice. When you ignore the words of the prophet long enough, God will say, all right, all right. And God delivers you over to what you want and that should scare you to death. Because you see the the, the, the correct response is so much easier to say, I trust in the Lord. I trust in Yahweh, the God who has saved me, the God not only of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the God who was the God of Moses who gave them the law, the God of David who gave him the covenant that your son will be on their throne. But not only that, but he's the God that came to life, took on flesh, and died on that cross to remove your sin and your shame. And yet you would have the audacity to trust in anything but him. You see, trust is easy. Worship is easy. Worship flows out of us. Go to a concert. Go to a football game. Worship is simple. The object of your trust, the object of your worship must change. But Amaziah's there, and he's got his little gods all around him, and he's worshiping them, and he's bowing down to them. And in his confidence in those gods, he turns to Israel and says, come on, bud, bring it. <laughs> Y'all seen the Geico commercial? Whichever commercial they have the don't mess with my discount, and the guy there like drag racing, and the one guy's going, come on, man, you want to go? You want to go? Ah! He said, it's just crazy. And the guy's like, no, man, I, I'm not gonna mess with my discount. This is, this is kind of him. He's the idiot there challenging because he's got his little gods. You see, trust in the Lord with all your heart, that went out the window a while back. I got my gods now. I stole these gods from Mount Seir. Let's fight. King Joash says, sit down, Sparky. You, you don't want any of me. And he goes, no, man, I want it. Let's go, let's, let's do it. And God routed Amaziah. Jehoash comes down and knocks down 200 yards of the wall of Jerusalem. He captures Amaziah. He captures all sorts of plunder. And he takes him back to Israel. God just put a smack down on Amaziah. And he deserved it 100%. Because he did not trust in Yahweh. It's that simple. Trust in Yahweh. Trust in the one who made the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Trust the one who gave this beautiful foreshadowing law to Moses. Trust in the one who called out to David and said, David, your son is going to be the eternal reigning king. Trust in the one who became flesh for your sake and died on that cross to save you to rescue you from yourself. Trust in that one. Amaziah's story is tragic. It is tragic for one reason and one reason only. 
it could have been this most triumphant, beautiful life. But he said, I will not trust in Yahweh. I will trust in my numbers, and I will trust in these gods, and I will trust in myself. And his life was a tragedy because of that. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel. Trust the Lord with all of your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge Yahweh, the God of Israel, the one who became flesh and died in your place. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make straight your paths. Your life will not be a tragedy. It will be a triumph. You will be the one who does not want lying down in green pastures, being led beside the still waters. His rod and his staff will comfort you all the days of your life. But it just depends on who you trust. Let's pray. Father, save us from ourselves. Save us from ourselves, Father. We have so many opportunities just to to say that you are enough for us. To say that you can satisfy 